Okie dokie. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for joining us on this, what is pretty much quite a grotty night in, in North Wales from, from the sound of what I can hear outside. So uh, we'll take you to somewhere nice and warm and sunny, uh, the island of Mallorca. Um, so the the, uh, the talk is called Birding Balearica. Um, it's my family and other animals on Mallorca. Uh, I did a similar talk a few years ago from uh, a trip where I went to the island of Lesbos, uh, which also worked quite well as uh, as a destination to combine a family holiday and a birding trip. Um, so I've always, you know, I, I'm sure that most people do. They sort of love holidays and, and fam family holidays have always been very special. Um, you know, from, from when I was young, you know, my parents uh, would take me somewhere around the UK. And uh, I think this was around about 1988. Uh, we went down, uh, my mum and dad took me and my mate Dave Furhurst down to East Anglia. And we did a little bit of volunteer wardening at Minsmere. And uh, and part of the holiday was was seeing birds that I'd never seen before, you know, things like night jars and uh, I think it's stone curlews and golden oriole and stuff like that. So 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 birding holidays with the family are always very exciting. Um, so when we went down to Weymouth, you know, going to places like Slimbridge, there's me and my mum feeding some Hawaiian geese. And even when I, when I could drive, um, I was going down to the southwest for the first time. And uh, fair play, my dad offered uh, to take me down, uh, you know, my mum come along. So I could uh, go and see some of the birds and also spend time with the family. Um, that was to see things like sail bunting, um, you know, stuff that, you know, very localised in the UK. And um, even as I got older and uh, even when my mum passed away, you know, we'd do a few uh, birding holidays, me and my dad, usually up to Scotland. And uh, also we did North North at once. So there's a, us up at, um, at John O'Groats. And, uh, you know, just great to experience a few birds uh, with my dad. Um, but there's uh, Rianne, uh, who's my girlfriend, now wife uh, of, uh, well, 25 years uh, this year in uh, a couple of weeks time. I'll have to remember not to forget this wedding anniversary. Um, and we've been lucky enough to have uh, three kids. Um, there's uh, Reese on the left, uh, Sean and Nia and Quacky Duck in the middle. Um, so one of the favourite spots we've had as family holidays over the year, quite often we've gone up to Scotland because uh, it's one of the few places that like February half term you can almost most guaranteed snow uh well we haven't previous years i don't think it's been very good this year so we, we've had a lot of holidays to cold places uh well as in usually re repeat holidays to scotland where we'd have a little bit of fun uh so we could go sledging uh, up on cairngorm and also a bit of traveling around to see things like nessie and uh and uh met up with bill slade once um bill and jill um, where he had some uh pine martins coming to feed us in his caravan so uh, that was great to see with the family and Lock Garden's also a great place to to take sort of family and uh, feed feed the birds. So there's uh, you know there's cold tits coming to the hand there, and sitting on your head there's a nice cold tit on Sean's head. And um, quite often while, while we're feeding the cold tits, the uh, the crested tits come in very close. So it's good to combine a, a little bit of photography as well while we're, everyone's having fun feeding the birds. Uh, family holidays. Uh, funny thing, because my, my family generally don't like getting up early in the morning. So when we've been to Scotland, I, I'm usually up at the crack of dawn, up in the forest, um, trying to hunt down uh, things like capercaillie, uh, which I've been lucky enough uh, a few times, you know, first in the forest. Uh, but usually my, my family's still fast asleep in bed while uh, I'm sort of doing a bit of early morning birding. But yeah, it's, it's one of my favourite spots, uh, Scotland, over the years, and uh, that's up Cairngorm. Um Now... My wife, she she's chose a few holidays over the years. Uh, she took us to Butlins at Minehead once. Um, I won't really go on about that. Uh, but there's usually a carrot after something like that so that I don't misbehave. Uh, the carrot this time was I could go down to Land's End. We'd had a few days at Land's End afterwards. So I could go to Porthguara to join up with people like this and spend a few hours each day staring out at this, the Runnel Stone, uh, waiting for large shear waters uh, to go by um you know especially hoping for things like corries and, and great great sheer water um okay now we, we've had other family holidays that we've sort of uh enjoyed um um or should i say enjoyed um sort of this was uh euro disney um the carrot on this this particular occasion um 
well, it wasn't the honey buzzard that was flying over our accommodation, which was very nice. That was probably my highlight of uh, of Paris, Euro Disney. Uh, but we went to, we drove from Paris to Northern Germany for two days to go to the biggest bird zoo in the world. So uh, I know it's cheating really, but I did get to see uh, over those two days things like Schubert Stork and Kagu. And, uh, and to be fair, I think the kids actually probably enjoyed it just as much, if not more, than uh, when we went to uh, Euro Disney, uh, probably because there were no queues and it, the temperature it wasn't as warm as it was in Paris and, and the birds were fantastic. So, as I said, we did Lesbos, uh, I think that was in 2014. Uh, combining a family holiday, you know, you've got to have a little bit of swimming, you know, some family activities. But Lesbos was great because there was a lot of wildlife you know you'd find things like herman's tortoise and uh, so it was great to show you know kids find the tortoise it's absolutely fantastic and when they were younger they'd sort of still enjoy you know more looking at the wildlife you know things like nesting uh white stalks on churches and obviously i got to sort of get some good birds uh, and some of the things in lesbos were eastern european specialties things like blackheaded bunting so that was they were fantastic to see and i have tried to get the kids into wildlife over the years, you know, by exposing them to things like, you know, moths in the moth trap or slow worms in Ken Cross back garden, uh, rock pooling, uh, chemlin and chem ice, uh, even though I think you can tell from this look at my son, Reese, he's more into cooking now. And I think even then he was looking at a lobster. He wasn't thinking what a fine specimen of a creature. He's probably thinking that would uh, be quite nice in a thermidor sauce. Now I've not had a great deal of luck over the years of getting them, into becoming birders as, as such. And, and I put part of this down to maybe taking them to places like Amloch Sewage Farm in the winter to look at the settling beds to see whether there's any chiff chaffs on there. So I suppose you could say it's not that surprising that, you know, I might have put them off birds uh, a little bit. And I think there's my wife on the on the right there, Rianne. So I think she knew this was going to happen, and she thought, just give it time, and they will they will drift over to hockey. And fair play, she's she's got they're all very sporty, so uh, she's got them all playing hockey now for Bangor, and you know they're doing well, like for North Wales as well. So Near East and Sean uh, all playing hockey. Sean still plays football as well, which is quite nice because that's like one of my passions as well as birds. So I do still get to go to the football. It's usually with Sean. And because he's still relatively small and cute, he does act as a good lure. It's great for getting photographs of celebrities like Steven Gerrard. And uh, one of the great times was actually meeting Ray Clements um, because um, Sean used to have a, a DVD, he used to go to bed watching about goalkeeping, sort of goalkeepers. And when we played football in the back garden, we had to choose which player and which goalie we were. And Sean was always Ray Clements, right? Because he knew he was Liverpool's best ever goalie. So I got to meet Ray Clements with Sean. And I told him that Sean is always Ray Clements. And he said, well, he's obviously been brought up well then, hasn't he? So that, so that was great. And uh, it was a great night because um, um, we beat Barcelona 4-0 and then went on to win the European Cup. So that was in 2019. So Mallorca, family holidays. Now, reading up about it, um, you know, they say Mallorca, the family won't need much convincing and the birding is great. So what are you waiting for? And there's a great quote here. It says that Mallorca is an ideal destination for a first foreign birding trip and also for attempting to combine a family holiday with a spot of birding in the sun. The landscapes of the eastern half of the island and the opportunities they offer uh, the Vitim bird are surprisingly rich and varied. And the thing I like about this is it says attempting to combine a family holiday with a spot of birding because, you know, that that is what it is, really. Um, there are some good birds there. Black vulture, Eleanor's falcon, Aldwin's gull, moustache warbler, Balearic shearwater and the warbler. Uh, they're all rare or difficult to see in most other parts of Europe. And there's also some big name birds that in Britain, you know, we, we sort of really want to see things like little bitten, squacko heron, purple heron, great white egret, red crested potchard, purple gallinule, crested coot, and, and quite a selection of exciting birds. Um, you know, and more southern species, you know, things like stone curlew, quail, Kentish plover. plover. Um, so there is a good selection of birds, including like the Mediterranean birds, like hoopoe and crag martin. Um, there, there's a good selection there. Uh, now, we went in August, so probably not the best time for migration. So some of the sort of specialities like collar pratt and coal, alpine swift, uh, Auckland, they, they weren't particularly moving through when we were there. But uh, that's probably a good thing, because if there's too many birds, I'd probably end up spending less time with the family. Uh, the main places where I went birding was the the mountain range, the Tramontana range, uh, the Boca Valley of the Fomenta Peninsula. 
Albufura National Park, a big wetland reserve, and then there's a smaller reserve not far away called Albufureta, uh, the Arta Peninsula, and southern Majorca. But I, I didn't really do much in the south there. So Majorca is just off the eastern coast of Spain. Um, when you when you actually look at a map, it does look a little bit like if you got Anglesey ripped Holy Island off and turned it upside down, it does look a little bit similar, really. But it's about twice as big, so it tends to take about an hour to get from one side to the other, say from Parma to uh, where we were staying, uh, Alcudia, just south of uh, Palencia. Now, the day that we went it was absolutely horrendous. There was there's torrential rain, even though it was August. Um, we, we, you know, we, we were in a massive traffic jam, but luckily for us, we were a little bit late getting to the airport, but the, when we finally got on the plane, which was delayed, uh, we found out the reason why the plane, the flight was delayed is because the pilot was stuck in the same traffic jam that we were. So, uh, thankfully he was coming from where, where we were traveling. So we, we traveled and got there sort of late in the evening. Um, uh, so it was like bog standard hotel, but it was on the coast, um, but it was really nice sort of waking up in the morning because it had a great view over the uh, over the sea. So fantastic sunrise. Uh, we had two rooms. I was actually having to share the room with uh, my son, Reese. Um, sunrise, it wasn't too early. It was only seven o'clock in the morning. But I, I physically dragged him out of bed to make him watch the sunrise and said, look, look at that. That is, is beautiful. And I think he was actually the only other member of my family that actually did get up for the sunrise and that's only because I made him uh, so I went out there first morning you know it's it's always the best time isn't it you know for first morning on a foreign trip you know you're full of excitement because you know you're going to see some birds and wildlife that you don't see on a regular basis so as the sun was rising the first thing I saw on the beach was this uh, this lady was dancing and uh, uh, there was someone taking photographs of her uh, but I, th I think the reason European or Russian um, because they started to have an argument so I thought I didn't take a photograph ironically I just put googled um, woman dancing on beach sunrise and uh, I pretty much I probably got their photograph but what I was actually looking for was was some of the local speciality birds like there's uh, uh, the Mediterranean subspecies of shag uh, that was flying by um, but one, one thing that was fantastic first morning um, is uh, five greater flamingos just flew in off the sea and I thought that, that's something that you don't see at Point Linus you know flamingos flying in off the sea so so that was that was a good start to the day um and typical sort of beach but you know very quiet first thing in the morning um so you know best time of the day and it, it's still relatively cool then because it did get quite hot so typical mediterranean birds just walking up and down on the edge of the beach there came across some hoopoe um now that this uh you know we see hoopoes in Britain, you know, they're always a speciality to see a, a nice bird, a rarity. So uh, it's always a treat to see them. So they're common in places like Majorca. So uh, it, it's great to have the opportunity to get up close to them, get some nice photographs because um, they are rather special looking birds. And, uh, and like when they fly, they, they, they do look, it's like, you know, they say it's like a, a, a bird that wants to be a butterfly. Some more familiar species, things like wood pigeon, uh, but one thing I thought was quite strange, uh, wasn't expected, there was, a, there was a, a small pool in the back garden of a villa and there was uh, this lovely juvenile uh, crossbill. Um, so uh, that was that was quite nice to get some shots of that as it came down to the poolside just to have an early morning drink. Uh, the It's part of the red crossbill species, uh, the several subspecies um, around, uh, well, the world and, and Europe. But as you can see down there, um, there's the the balearic uh, subspecies is is a separate subspecies um but oh, i'll move on from that so yeah so yeah what i was just going to say is with crossbills the different species tend to have uh different bill sizes uh um the the common crossbill uh has got quite a small bill size the ones that we get in scotland are uh chunkier again but not as chunky as the parrot crossbills that tend to breed up in uh, northern scandinavia it generally uh, relates to the size of the pine cones that they're chewing really and sort of how efficient their uh, mechanism is for opening uh, the pine cones uh, the subspecies on uh, the subspecies on Mallorca is supposed to be a relatively small build one which you can sort of see with the juvenile uh, it's a very nice fresh looking juvenile uh, but 
the the adult birds did seem to have quite large bills, really, um, if if not sort of quite long upper mandibles, especially. Uh, they did seem. I don't know whether it's just because they're in a sort of a, a sunnier country. They did seem to be kind of duller stroke more sun bleach than the ones that we get in the uk these the green females were quite sort of uh, uh washed out and and the males weren't very bright but they did seem to have quite large long upper mandibles other familiar birds of the mediterranean um sorry that's a female uh, or juvenile um sardinian warbler um, and one of the other specialities, uh, Alduin's gull, they're, they're nice to see because it's a very localised gull, uh, speaking on a, like world terms, because it's generally only found in the Mediterranean and just outside uh, the Mediterranean into the Atlantic. Uh, as you can see from the distribution here uh, on a European map. <laughs> um, the other bird uh, that was quite common on the first day is, uh, well, thought it was spotted flycatcher. Well, it is a spotted flycatcher, um, but it just reminds me a few years ago, was it 2017, there was a report of a Mediterranean flycatcher in, in Yorkshire, uh, which ironically turned out that DNA confirmed that it was just spotted flycatcher. Um, but the the Mediterranean flycatcher is, it, it used to be part of uh, spotted flycatcher, uh, but it breeds in the uh, the Balearic Islands, and the, well, basically the Western Mediterranean Islands. And when I first saw this, you think, who on earth invented this? Yeah, it wasn't this chap. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, sort of Mediterranean flycatcher. Um, when, when you look at it, it's very much like a spotted fly, but it's not very streaky on the breast and the forehead is very sort of, is very streaky. Um, you can see very plain on the breast, whereas the spot flies that we get in the UK uh, have got quite a lot of streaks on the, on the upper breast. Um, now, Mediterranean flycatcher, um, it's, there are actually uh, two forms of it. Um, there's one on the Balearic Islands and the other, what the other type is found in Corsica and Sardinia. So here's a map. I think it's an Ian Lewington by the looks of it. So spotted flycatcher is on the left. Uh, that's like the typical spot fly, what we normally see. The one in the middle is um, Tyrenica. Uh, that's like a very brownish looking spotted flycatcher. And then on the right, you've got Balearica, uh, which is the one that you get on Mallorca, which is very white underneath, not a very streaky breast and a very nice stripy forehead. Um so um, the subspecies um, um, Tyrenica, um, that stems from uh, the, uh, the area around the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea. Uh, so it's basically Corsica and Sardinia there. So uh, the hotel was full of oleander bushes. Um, I was... I do like moths, so I was keeping my eye out for moths. Uh, I was hoping for oleander hawk moth, but uh, I've never managed to see that. Uh, well, I've seen one in Ghana once uh, a distance, and I did breed some once, but they're absolutely probably one of the best moths in the world, in my opinion. Um, so then, after a bit of early morning birding, it's like back to the, the breakfast in the hotel. Um, and then we had to do something I'm not very good at, which is actually lying on a beach. So we uh, we, we did a little bit on the beach, uh, not very long, though. Uh, my wife was just kind of just kind of staying out of the sun because um, um, obviously we didn't want to get sunburned. Uh, my son was he was lapping it up. He was enjoying a bit of sunshine. Uh, but I took a bit of bread from breakfast. And w one of the things that was quite fun to do is you sprinkle bread in the in the sea and these little fish, uh, these little, uh, I think they're called pompano, that one at the bottom there. Uh, you get shoals of those sort of coming in. So you can sort of, we did actually get some um, some little uh, snorkel and visors and stuff. So we, we did have a little go of snorkeling. It was quite nice. Uh, someone gave us one of these things. So we're kind of fooling around with that like the first morning. And unfortunately, some freak wave came in. And uh, it kind of uh, it, it knocked me back. Uh, I've got a bit of a stoop anyway, so it probably didn't help. That sort of, uh, um, and I felt like Bert Troutman, um, who, who was he, he was a German uh, footballer, played for Man City, and the, his most famous thing, I think, the 1956 FA Cup final. He broke his neck, and he carried on till the end of the match to help Man City beat Birmingham three one. Um, so uh, I did feel a little bit like Bert Troutman and uh, one, one of the sort of uh, claims to fame is uh, my dad sold an aerial 350 uh, motorbike to Bert Troutman back in the day so uh, there's a little bit of a link to a famous footballer so after having a bit of whiplash we we resided to the the pill side where the, the only birds I could find there was some plastic toco toucans and, uh, and a massive chicken so 
you know, we did this for the morning for a few hours and then uh, um, we we kind of obviously had to go and do something completely different after that. So, because I think I would have got massively bored if I'd spent more than a few hours just uh, on, the, on the beach. So, so we headed off in the car. We headed up to uh, Cape Fomento, which is a peninsula top right. So we were staying just south of where it says Alcudia there. Um, I, I did actually, I went, I think 2006, I went to Mallorca at a long weekend with Bonnie Lilly, one of my friends. And so that was a good, a good weekend birding trip. So I'd been up there with her before. Uh, but what I didn't realise is, is in, in mid-peak sort of tourist season, like this was, this was in August, uh, uh, they actually closed the road from 10 a.m. Um, till, um, I think, yeah, till, till it goes dark. So if you go to the Cape, you've got to get up there at the crack of dawn. So we, we couldn't go this afternoon. So we went to this place, S. Um, Now, it's it's got a nice view up the Fermenta uh, Peninsula. Um, and there's some nice walks on the top of the cliffs. Uh, so there's the family. Uh, obviously having a good time you can tell by the look on his face there and um so yeah it was it was a pleasant pleasant little walk but um you could probably see part of the reason why we went there is it's um it's actually really good for swifts there and uh, so there's good photo opportunities and there's nesting pallid swifts um so so they they were coming you know quite close um the browner very pale face with a dark, dark around the eye. And if you get a nice view with the light, you can see the very kind of scaly underneath as well. Now, you do also get common swifts as well. So they, they do tend to be quite a bit darker um, than the pallid swifts. Uh, I think one, one of the best times where I saw pallid swift was actually Crosby Marina in Liverpool because there was one pallid with uh, five common swifts. So you really could pick out when you get a small flock together uh, the difference in colour. Um, but at this viewpoint in Mallorca, it's it's quite good that you do get both species and it's, it's good for getting photo opportunities. So um, you can see they do tend to be quite a bit browner with a, a whiter face uh, and the dark mask and this quite scaly appearance. So they've got quite two-tone wings as well compared to the common swifts. Uh, which which are, are, are common here in in the UK. Uh, one of the downsides of going to Mallorca in August is a lot of the adult birds are heavily molt. So this is a crag martin and this is scabby as anything. Uh, but I did manage to get some photos of a nice fresh juvenile. So so the juveniles are all looking you know pretty smart, but a lot of the adult birds uh, in Mallorca in August are a little bit on the worn side. Uh, and then it was back to the hotel uh, where um, we, every hotel seemed to have its own Alduin's goal patrolling its section of beach there. And uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, to get up close to these uh, these uh, localised gulls from the Mediterranean. So next day, while the family was still in bed, uh, I got up at the crack of dawn and uh, headed to the Cape where obviously we couldn't the day before because um it, it was closed um so you know so this is just literally just after seven o'clock so that's when the sun was rising so it's, it's very beautiful you can drive right down to the lighthouse there, there is a cafe there um uh, it wasn't wasn't open then um but then there was just a few of the motorbikes not many people there but it was great to watch the sunrise uh, uh from the cape there and um so there's some good habitat some little uh sort of scrubby uh gorges just around the tip there which is good for wildlife uh, very windy the roads um so nice tarmac though so the miocra is very popular with cyclists because the, the roads are generally uh very good so so this is a view looking back to the lighthouse so that's we just sort of walked um bird birding those areas there now one of the things i was hoping for was eleanora's falcon uh, which is a speciality of, of miorca but ironically the the first falcon that i came across was uh was this peregrine falcon um a bit of a distance and then started flying around but uh it was definitely peregrine um around the lighthouse uh there's a few blue rock thrushes um so when was this so this but again heavily in molt so you know they weren't the sort of best of nick um this was the one that was in the Cotswolds was it in uh, Stow on the Wold in December 2016 you know that that was that was nice the one they were trying to say was an escape for ages and then 
it uh, when it disappeared, it turned up it beats your head before it went back to Europe, which was brilliant. So that that was that was a male in the middle of winter in the Cotswolds. Uh, and there's, there's there's the twitch in the fog, uh, but it, it it did bring uh, joy to the masses that were there. So uh, so that was that was a good bird. So it, it's nice seeing birds that are rare in, in Britain. You know when you, when you see them in the sort of native uh, native lands uh, where they're quite common. Now from the Cape as well. Um, when you look down onto the sea, there's quite a few large shearwaters just offshore. Uh, they're not particularly close, so it's quite difficult to get sort of decent photographs. Um, but these are the Corries type shearwaters. Um, so in recent years, uh, it's been split into Corries shearwater and Scopoli shearwater. And th there's also the other one in there's like a trio is the Cape Verde shearwater, which is off the Cape Verde Islands further down in West Africa. So Scopoli shearwater is the one that prevalent, uh, it more commonly breeds in the mediterranean and the corries tend to be more on the uh actually out in the atlantic even though there, there is a colony inside the mediterranean but um that both of them uh go in and out so uh, they are quite difficult to uh you know just because of you're in the mediterranean there's no guarantees it's going to be scopolis um and and, and vice versa um, and the, the the differences are, are quite subtle uh like things like bill size and finer detail on the underwing so you you really need a very good look and ideally a very good photograph to 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 clinch them so um one of the work, birds you want to see was uh, this was um uh, balearic warbler uh, this is one that splits from uh, memora's warbler i got a photograph of it like when i just got out of the car and then it went into a bush and then it turned into this and I was very confused initially because I thought, I'm sure I'd just seen Balearic Warbler and then realised that this was a, a, um, a young male Sardinian Warbler that's molting from its juvenile plumage into its adult plumage. So it's a good job of taking the photographs because otherwise um, I would have convinced myself that I hadn't seen uh, Memora's Warbler, uh, but luckily I'd, uh, I got it on, uh, on camera. So you can see uh, it's got like the orangey coloured bill and, and similar coloured legs compared to the sort of dark legs of the, uh, of the of the Sardinian warbler. So I started going around the headlands looking for other stuff like uh, some of the little mountain goats that live there. Uh, and then had Eleonora's falcon briefly uh, go down a little gorge. So I followed it. But as I followed it, um, I came across some better views of some uh, Balearic warblers, uh, which was great to see. They're similar to... Dartford warblers, you know, very grey, um, uh, but they, they're kind of quite pale underneath, a bit peachy, um, and they've also got like quite a palish throat, and they like these this this low scrubby habitat uh, that seems very uh, localized to to sort of the, these coastal areas. Um, they did like this sort of habitat, um, so these are the Balearic warblers. That there was there's quite a few around the Cape there. And they, they would come in if you'd pish, make pishing noise. Psh, psh, psh. Um, they were they were quite curious, so they'd come in. And you could get good close views of them. So when you look at Balearic warbler, you can see it's got sort of this all greyish warbler with a pale throat and also a bit of buffish pink hue on the flanks. And you can see they're just fine found on uh, Majorca and Ibiza uh, to the west. Then the other similar uh, warbler is the Memora's warbler, uh, but it's more lead grey on the flanks and it's got a dark throat. Um, and Dave Owen, uh, one of my mates from St. Helens, uh, he took these photos of the bird that was at Blorenge near Abergavenny uh, back in 2010. Um, I asked him if I could borrow these because I couldn't put my finger on mine and he was stood next to me uh, at the time and he got, literally got exactly the same photos of what I did because his photos got in Birding World. And I remember opening Birding World magazine and thinking, hold on, I never sent the photos and then realised that because he was stood next to me, he got identical photographs. So so this this is the slightly different uh, Memora's Warbler. Uh, so this breeds uh, further over on uh, sort of Sardinia and Corsica and some of the other smaller Mediterranean islands. And, and it winters in North Africa, so or some of them do. So that's probably why it periodically, on very rare occasions, turns up in the UK, sort of going back to those islands from North Africa and just massively overshooting uh, for, for a Memora's Warbler anyway. Um, I did come across this um, male blue rock thrush and it was beating something to death. And initially I thought it was a lizard because uh, it seemed quite big. Uh, it's just absolutely thwacking it away. And then I realised when I looked up closer, it was actually a convolvulus hawk moth. Um, uh, so, you know, th these are one of the sort of North African migrant moths that work their way up uh, through the breeding through the summer uh, throughout Europe. 
and they're absolutely huge moths. You know, what you know, sort of it's a moth moth trapper's delight to get a convolvulus hole moth in the trap. And you can see how big they are. There's 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 one on my face there. So that's one that David Wright caught on Bedavid Mountain a few years back now. Um, but you can see that they they can reach as far north as sort of Lapland and even southern Iceland, and they are well hard. They can they can they can fly and feed in wind and rain, and apparently they've got a thirteen. 13 uh, centimeter tongue as well some some of the big ones so uh, it's one, one hell of a migrant moth that so um and that they're carrying on the tradition of putting moths on the face uh, maybe that's also one of the reasons why my, my children aren't into wildlife as much as as me they maybe they just don't like having large moths put on their face but there's a uh, sean uh, slightly begrudgingly having an eyed hawk moth on his face maybe it's just because they, they are a little bit tickly as well so um, after seeing the um, Balearic warblers, uh, a pair of Eleanorus falcons uh, sort of started to show, which was brilliant. So the, they're, they're a bit like a, a hobby on steroids, like stretched, uh, very rufous underneath, but long wings and long tail. Uh, and they were mating just at the end of this gorge. So it was, it was great, to, great to actually see them. So nice and rufous underneath, but still quite, quite white on the throat. Um, so then after a bit of birding, it was back to uh, back to the beach for a little bit there. OK, so um, what did we do that afternoon after a few hours on the beach? We headed to the Arta Peninsula. Um, so that's just probably about half an hour's drive from from where we were in Alcudia. Um, we were going to the um, where were we going to um, the place. Uh, there's a little. Uh, yeah just north of Arta there was a little uh monastery uh that I, I did see it's in Thekla Lark in the past so I, I thought that the family would like really like to see Thekla Lark so we headed off the, up there to Ometa de Bethlehem that's the one uh very narrow roads uh you know so you're really careful you're not like scraping the hire car um so you know fun, funny little like little thinkers around there and uh, and we we got to this quite it, I suppose it was a little bit spooky, um, this, this uh, monastery that we, we came to. And, um, but while we were going for a bit of a walk there, um, I could hear a uh, Now, this is photographs uh, I took. Uh, Rihanna, I'm on video here as well, just to let you know. Um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there was Rhinec calling. Um, so, uh, you know, Rhinec's fantastic birds. Probably the best one I've ever seen was at Kemlin because it was, like, really approachable. And, um, and and so I could hear it calling like key, key, key. they sound a bit like kestrels. Uh, so we headed off, sort of walking away. And then, uh, but we got the this, this spooky looking uh, uh, monastery. Uh, and then we went past this shrine. It was like shrine to Our Lady, uh, to Mary. Um, but I suppose it did look a little bit spooky. And then Sean just suddenly wasn't happy. And to be fair, there, was, there were apart from this distant rhinette that I did, there wasn't much bird song. There was the sound of wind going through the bushes. And then he just kind of got really like freaked out, really. He was just like, I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. And, you know, we think he's not normally like this. Like, what, what's what's wrong? What's wrong? But little did we know that Sean on the left there, um, I think a few days before when me and my wife were at work, um, Reese had put on uh, a horror movie called The Nun, you know, and it was you know it was a little bit scary right and he, he let sean watch it didn't he so and with a little bit of winding up from his sister from near um you know that's that was the reason why sean went into meltdown so i mean that that's one of the sort of you know downsides of like birding with the family like sometimes you have to abort um you know the birding because uh well like this case it's because sean had uh had sort of gone into meltdown and we had to sort of like go back to the car and get the hell out of uh, spookyville um so anyway, we went back to the hotel. Uh, I dropped them off, and then uh, I went to do a little bit of birding, just just not far from the hotel near a place called Alba Ferretta. Um, I had noticed this place as we were driving past, and the, these flowers like caught my eye. I thought, oh, I've never seen those before. And uh, it was a little nature reserve um, called Les Dunes, and um, you know you could see things like uh, sea holly, um, like what you get at places like Gronant, and then. The, uh, the flower at the background, uh, I think they call it Lily de Mer, uh, Lily of the Sea. Um, I think it's one of its English names, also the Sea Daffodil. And it's a fantastic looking flower. Um, you know, I, I have got an interest in botany, not, nothing major, but, you know, you can't help but be uh, impressed by by this flower. Um, so, you know, some, some, 
it was half of it was in flower and uh, others were still ready to come. So that that was a photo I was really pleased with, but a very beautiful uh, sort of seed daffodil that. So that, that was nice to see. Um, and they do put up signs around there because there are some nesting birds on the beach, um, as well as the Aldwins gulls that were feeding on the seaweed, trying to see what they could find. Um, there was also uh, small flocks of Kentish plover, um, you know, so they're nice to see because very rare in the UK, despite the fact that they do come to northern France and the Netherlands. Um, you know, I think there's like one in Somerset at the moment, but they, considering how far, you know, we're not that far away, uh, we get very few Kentish plovers really. So, you know, they were quite common on the beach at, uh, at Mallorca, so that, that was nice to see. So, yeah, so just did a little bit of a walk on the beach and then... Um, this thing flew over absolutely stonking Eleanor's falcon. It was closer than the ones that had seen mating um, earlier that day on the Cape. Um, so, you know, they're, they're a bit bigger than a hobby. They've got very black, very dark underwings, very rufous, uh, and then we've got this lovely sort of white throat, but, you know, really, really stunning looking falcon. And and quite quite a sort of a strange, you know, breeding biology. They, they literally breed in the Mediterranean and some of the islands just in the Atlantic, uh, just outside the Mediterranean. Uh, they arrive late because uh, they coincide the breeding cycle with when like European birds are migrating south in the autumn and, and spend a lot of time catching migrants to feed to their young. And then when they've finished uh, breeding, they all head south and they all go to Madagascar for the winter, which is just like just crazy. Um, uh, last May, though, um, I did the pilgrimage. I went down to May to see the Eleanor's falcon that turned up in Kent. Um, and that photograph there, it's uh, it's quite good to see. It was Eleanor's falcon, female red-footed falcon to the left and hobby to the right. And you think normally, you you know, especially living in North Wales, we'd be happy to see a hobby in a day, but getting hobby, red-footed falcon and the Eleanor's falcon in the same shot was just pretty amazing. Um, and this bird was really awesome. It just wasn't bothered by people. It was a bit wet in the morning. So as soon as the sun came out, it dried off and it started hunting for dragonflies. And it was showing over, you know, amazingly well over people's heads. So it was just, a, I think it was a second year female. I think they worked it out as, but absolutely stunning bird. Um, you know, it does look a bit like a cross between sort of a, a hobby and a, and a peregrine. Uh, there's hobbies that were feeding alongside it on, on the same day. Um, you see hobbies have got that sort of uh, that kink uh, white coming up on the neck, uh, whereas the Eleanor's falcon doesn't have that. And and the Eleanor's falcon is a lot more rufous, but it's a much bigger bird as well. It's, it's a much bigger bird. So there's there's hobby. Hobbies look tiny in comparison. Um, so there is sort of doing a, an eye level pass by. Um and that's uh, yeah. So that's the that's the one I had in Mallorca. Um, so yeah, the, you know it's it is a good place to see them because um, um, uh, I wouldn't bank on seeing them every year in Kent. So next morning um, started off uh, not far from where the hotel was. Uh, the red pin, the red balloon there. That's where our hotel was. And if you look just to the south, there's a big greeny area. That's Albufeira Marsh. Um, it's a very good wetland site. And uh, so I'd, I'd sort of, the days I went there, I went there a couple of days, I'd get there just before the sun comes up. And it is quite, a bit, well, there's like a big long, you can't drive into the reserve. So you have to park on the outside by the main roads, a little car park and walk in a mile or two um, along this, runs alongside this this canal. Um, so it's always very pleasant, you know, first thing in the morning and the night herons would just be starting to move from their sort of being active at night to where they were going to roost for the day. So um, that canal uh, quite often is good for uh, for night herons just in the edge of the reeds. And as the sun comes up, they tend to go back and hide in the vegetation. Uh, some of the passerines that were uh, quite common around there, things like nightingale, um, Always nice to see hoopoes, you know, beautiful birds, you know, again, sort of quite close. Um, but there's there's quite a few scrapes and wetland areas there. So um, it was good for seeing and photographing uh, some wading species, things like green sandpiper. So that's like a northern species that's finished breeding and it's heading south to, to Africa for the winter. Um, the reeds and sort of sedgy areas, things like fantail warbler or zitting cysticola uh, were quite common around there. And uh, there's also small numbers of glossy ibis and more familiar species like marsh harrier sort of hunting over the reed beds there. Um, and then we come back to the uh, Mediterranean flycatcher, um, aka spotted flycatcher. So other things that were, because 
because we're getting into August, things are sort of moving around a bit. So like the reed warblers were coming out of the reed beds into the more wooded areas. Um, and then you still got nightingales. Um, you know, they, they were still breeding around there. So similar looking bird, but um, nice to see. And, and some of them were still singing as well because they got an amazing song, the nightingale. Um, what, one of the birds that is good to see in Albufeira, um, uh, and it's a great opportunity to see them up close, is uh, crested coot or red knobbed coot. Um, it's, it's quite a peculiar bird because... Um, there's a small like relic population in the Western Palearctic in, in sort of Southern Iberia and also in, in Northwest Africa. The population in Mallorca is actually an introduction scheme because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of Spain, uh, but it's very good habitat. And it, it was an ideal spot to, um, you know, to introduce them uh, to keep that species going like a, as a Spanish bird. Uh, but the majority of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, like in Southern Africa and East Africa. Um, as you can see, it's not got a very big distribution in, in Spain and it's not actually down on Mallorca because I think the Collins Guide, because I think they've got to be established for so many years before they count them as like a true population, even if it is introduced. Uh, one thing we did notice, though, is that the uh, Eurasian coots, the common coots, they, they were very aggressive towards the uh, the crested coots. Uh, and if, if if they got close to them, they'd, they'd, they'd always shoo them off. Uh, one of the other identification features uh, for, for red knob coot, spot them at a distance, is quite a lot of them have got these white neck collars on. Um, that's just so that you can keep an eye on uh, sort of any movements or sort of how, how long these birds are living for. Um, but as well as the ones with the big plastic rings on the neck, um, you know, the, there are quite a few that, you know, have actually second or third generation or even more um, that haven't got any neck collars on. Uh, but one of the... In the winter, um, the the red knob on the head uh, does the swelling goes down, so um, it's not always that obvious. So, so some of the and with some of the sub adult birds, some of the features that you can look for to tell the differences. If you look at the bill, it's actually quite bluish, whereas when you look at common coot, it's got like a pinky hue. And the other thing with common coot is it's got that black um, wedge that cuts between the bill and the shield, whereas um, red knob coot uh, doesn't have um, doesn't have that. Uh, that's just like there's um, more hens uh, with them as well. So uh, uh, it's quite nice seeing a few different species of uh, of uh, um, uh, coots and more hens together there. So that's I think that was a year old bird. So you can see it's only got a slight red swelling on the forehead there. Uh, and one thing I did notice, I did see I think it's a one juvenile. They're very very pale, um, you know, compared to sort of common coots. Um, look at look at this. This is obviously maybe this is a male in full breeding plumage because it's got really swollen. It's like there's big swollen lips on its head. It, it reminds me of uh, uh, Janice from the from the Muppets, you know, with the massive lips there. So there's a sort of similarity there. Um, but amazing looking birds, and you know, even though it's an introduction scheme, it, it was great to see them up close, just to sort of see them see them in the wild. Um, other birds that were quite common uh, around there at Albufeira is like the purple swamp hen. Um, purple swamp hen has been split into various different species over the years. The ones that we get in Europe and the Western Pal are Western swamp hen. Uh, and then you've got the African one. They've all got slightly different sort of coloration. Grey headed swamp hen. Uh, that's the one that you get in India. Um one of those turned up in Ch in Cheshire once, but that, that was a, an escaped captive bird. But it was still, I, I went for that one day. I think it was a quiet day in July, so I went to see that feeding in a in a ditch near Chester with 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 more hens. Um, but I think someone caught it up because it was the pet. And then there's the ones that you get in the Philippines uh, and Indonesia, and then the ones in Australasia. So again, quite a striking looking bird, bigger than the coot, uh, and it spends a lot of its time sort of pulling out reeds and eating the uh, the succulent uh, sort of root. Um, seems to be what, one of its favourite foods. So some of the migrant waders, it's a good spot there in Albufeira. There's a lot of scrapes. Reminds me a little bit like Minsmere. Things like green shank there, still in breeding plumage uh, on the way south for the winter. Uh, there's also quite good, nooks, good numbers of uh, marble ducks. Um, now, if you read the official numbers, that there's not many breeding in Spain or or, or the, um, uh, the Balearics, but they they have in they have been introducing sort of hundreds uh, to try and sort of bolster the population. That's why we did see quite a few and quite, most a lot quite a lot of them had rings on as well.
so other things that were quite common, things like little ring plover, um, and you could sort of see what the wetlands were like next to the, uh, the marsh was next to a power station as well, the only power station on the island. Um, other waders, there's flocks of uh, spotted red shanks coming through south, there's a nice cracking uh, adults in breeding plumage on the left. Um, I also think like you've got black red star, I think they should call them, you know, black reds, black red shanks, because um, um, they're, they're absolutely stunning in breeding plumage. Um, other things, as well as like the um, uh, fantail warblers, it was Chetty's warbler, uh, they, they were quite common and, uh, and a bit more showy than they tend to be in this country. Uh, and then we had a few species of heron, things like purple heron, again, you know, one of the Mediterranean species of heron, and squacko heron, a few of those uh, were knocking around the reserve, so, so that was good to see. Uh, I went back for seconds the following day, because um, one of the birds that I hadn't seen uh, that I wanted to see was the uh, the moustached warbler. Um, yeah. And um, um, so I used to think they're very much like you know, you look at them, they're quite similar to sedge warbler, but um, sedge warblers are a lot paler. And moustache warbler does have a very white supercilium, uh, a very dark crown. It's a very rufous bird. And um, this, this thing on the left, it says it's fond of reed jams near the surface. Um, I mean, ironically, it looks as if sedge warblers do that as well. But, um, um, well, coming back to moustache warbler in a minute, other things, this was a uh, great reed warbler. Uh, they're about the size of a starling. So, uh, you know, you're not going to mistake those. They're huge things. But yeah, the, one thing I noticed about the moustache warblers was how much time they did spend just creeping around at the base of the reeds. A bit like sometimes you see bearded tits doing, um, just sort of like looking for insects just on the surface of the water. Um, you know, very difficult to see, bottom left, uh, just creeping around. They, they just like wrens. It's probably like what sedge wren is like in North America. Um, because it just it just seemed to behave more like a wren than uh, anything like what you might expect a sedge warbler to be doing. So, you know, it was just good to see them. Again, this is obviously an adult bird because it's very warm, um, but it was showing really well. Um, and what, because I think the first time I'd missed them because I wasn't looking in the right place because someone told me, he said, you've got to just look at the base of the reeds at the edge of the water and they just, they just keep coming out, uh, which they did. So again, what was that zitting cysticola, uh, fantail warbler? Um, they, they tend to sort of be more just sitting out in the open. Um, so we're there in August, uh, starting to get, this was like one of the first winter visitors, because uh, I think robins don't actually breed on Mallorca. So uh, so that was uh, the only robin I saw of the trip, and, and that's supposed to be a, a winter migrant for the island. A um, few bits and bobs uh, insect-wise, I think that's the local subspecies of specklewood butterfly. So where we go? Yeah, um, went back then, and we went for, as a family. Went for a ride up into the mountains, the Tramontana Mountains. Um, it's it's quite scenic up there. <clears throat> I do remember going up there once with uh, with Bonnie, my Canadian friend, and as we were driving up in one of the mountain roads, a beech martin ran across the road. Beach Martin is like a pine martin, uh, but they've got more of a Mediterranean distribution. <clears throat> and I didn't realise that at the time, so I just shouted pine martin. And uh, so there's Bonnie with my daughter near. And uh, Bonnie didn't see it, right, because she was uh, she was actually eating a, a big bag of crisps or a big bag of potato chips, as she'd say, because she was from Canada. And um, it was quite hilarious, really, because uh, what happened was uh, I just screeched to a halt. There was no other cars around. I said, Bonnie, I said, Pine Mart, it's just run down. I said, get out the car and just run back and you might see it. And she she was eating some crisps at times. She got out the car and she looked at a bag of crisps and a binoculars. And it was like, she didn't know which to go for. And in the end, she actually grabbed the crisps and ran down the road. Yeah. Needless to say, sadly, she didn't see the Pine Martin. Uh, I don't know whether it was the sound of the rustling of crisps that frightened it away. But uh, we did have a great trip, though. It was a good laugh. Um, and, um, you know, we, we saw some cool birds, including breeding bee eaters, which I'll mention later. So we were up there, up in the mountains uh, with the family. Um, this sort of habitat, just a bit of like olive type scrub. Um, and small pines. Uh, there's quite a few fire crests up in the mountains, but again, August are so the little bit um, scruffy in plumage. So um, I've put in a nice picture of it. That, that's one that we had in Wilver Woods in the autumn. So so that was a, a much finer fettle and that, that was nice to see. So fire crests are quite common there, uh, just probably more uh, attractive looking in the spring. <clears throat> There are some, we were up at the Cuba Reservoir and there are some small pools up there. And uh, a 
apparently this this is one of the spots for the Mallorcan midwife toad. Uh, interesting fact is the Mallorcan midwife toad is actually a frog. It's not a toad. Um, so I had a quick look back, didn't see anything, but I, th I did think I did see, I think they used to have a population in Chester Zoo, um, which they were helping to sort of breed like as an ARC project to um, hopefully bolster numbers and then reintroduce them back into the wild. But that was, that was probably about 15, 20 years ago now. So the birds we saw around Cuba Reservoir, um, I remember seeing Nightingale. I had seen Tawny Pippet there in the past, but I didn't didn't see any on this trip. Uh, but one of the special birds up in the mountains there, we had Black Vulture. Um, so that was that was pretty cool to see. And, and Sean, Sean actually enjoyed that. So, uh, you know, absolutely huge Black Vultures. So uh, he, he got his uh, my binoculars and managed to sort of watch that. Uh, one of the birds I was hoping for up there that you get in in some of those sort of mountainous areas and also in the woodland in the foothills is uh, Moltoni's warbler. Um, there is a Mallorcan bird watching Facebook page, which was you know there's some useful information on there. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't manage to see Moltoni's warbler when I was there. But that, that would have been quite nice to see because I've never managed to bump into that. That that's been one of the splits from uh, subalpine warbler. So there's some good views up in the mountains. Um, so there's a nice sort of viewpoint there. Um, now, one of the places, one of the reasons I went to the mountains is I'd seen this picture of, of this beach called Sacolabra, so Sacolabra. And, and it just it just looks amazing on the postcard. And it reminded me a bit of Clash of the Titans, you know, sort of where the Kraken comes out of the sea. I was half expecting to see that. But the only problem with going there is you have to go on what I coined the road of death um, because, you know, there's some quite serious drops on the side of these roads and they don't have proper barriers. They have they have what we would call a curbstone right on the edge of it. That That is it to stop you going over the edge. And uh, and it was a proper windy road. And at the bottom of this windy road, which I, I'm sure it's about 10 kilometres long, there's the, the, it goes through this narrow patch through this big crack in the rock. And we got pretty much to the bottom of the mountain. We were probably about a kilometre away from the village. And um, and you could see there's a bit of a problem here. But just before I got to this bottleneck, right, um, three coaches came round the corner. And I was on this spot here. And you cannot pull off the road. There's two, you know, you, you're in a hire car. You're going to trash it. You're going to scrape it. I couldn't pull off the road and these three coach drivers, they would not back up. And, and very quickly I was, was snarled up behind me. And unfortunately, probably because I, my, my drag, my driving wasn't aggressive enough. Um, I, I should have gone forward quicker. It ended up clogging up the whole mountain and we were stuck in a traffic jam for about an hour until uh, this lady got off one of the coaches and started backing up traffic and that. And, uh, and thankfully, like, look how tight it was. It was like pretty, there was literally about an inch, you know, and God knows how, how the car never got scratched. And, and But the bus drivers did manage to get past the end. And then, so we, we got back, we got down. Luckily, because the mountain had been snarled up for about an hour, there was a lot of traffic that was trying to leave the village. So uh, the, the first cafe we came to where we parked up was, pretty empty so we just sat down and I said to Rianne said look we're, we're going to stay here for a bit because that that was a bit too stressful so um so we had we had a nice some nice pizza there and chilled out and uh the the other thing that cheered me up is just I, I do find it funny in in foreign countries you know some of the signs like you know sort of no urinating and uh, also the names of some of the cafes and uh, and the names of chocolate bars and things when you go abroad you know it does sort of titillate me slightly but so that cheered me up and I, I kind of chilled out a little bit after the stressful hour uh, on the road of death. Um, and then we got down to this beach, which was absolutely beautiful, to be fair. But to get to it, you've got to go through this tunnel, um, which was also very exciting, which was, was lit up. Um, and uh, you head down this long tunnel and it's actually got windows looking out over the little bay there and you get to the beach. Um, so, um, you know, this was the beach in question. Unfortunately, it was a little bit dark um because uh it was a bit cloudy you know it wasn't wasn't what i was hoping for uh you know the nice blue skies uh no sign of the kraken either but that was probably a good thing um but it was still still an exciting uh, place to visit and uh and there's a lot of shear waters offshore as well sort of corries type so they're probably scapolis or corries there but uh um you know they, they were just offshore there now i didn't actually see any balearic shear waters um 
didn't worry me too much because to be honest i normally go to bull bay uh you know it's a couple of you know probably about 10 minutes drive from my house to see them in the autumn it's it's a good spot because british waters are quite important for um for the migration of balearic shearwaters the, they reckon the world population is about 10 to thirty thousand birds um and they've done some survey work uh they did some i think 2014 uh, in the west english channel and the celtic sea um in the autumn they counted about seven thousand uh about seven thousand birds seven thousand balearic shearwater so you know a significant proportion of the world population does pass through british waters um so i wasn't too stressed out that i didn't see them over there but you know because we do see them quite well over here um and and they do stand out quite quite well compared to there's balearic shearwater on the right compared to manx shearwater on the left these are ones that I'd, photographs i've taken at bull bay um and like comparing these sort of what well, i mean they all used to be part of manx shearwater so so this this is manx shearwater uh, again probably off bull bay um sort of you can sort of see very black above very white below and it's got this like white color um that sort of stands out now that there is quite a significance to that which is something i've not really um sort of been majorly aware of until recently so very white underwing on manx shearwater like what we get in the uk and you can see that white collar on the back of the neck um so the, the three similar species you've got manx shearwater and then the two species you get in the mediterranean is yelquin shearwater which is very much like manx in the eastern med but balearic shearwater is very different to uh very different to to manx shearwater because it, it's it's fatter um and it's much darker um you know some of them are so dark they almost look like uh, small sooty shearwaters um but one of the things without yelquin is they do tend to have this darker mark on the underwing um manx shearwaters can have that as well um but if you look on the left there um one of the, one of the features of yelkun is they don't have that white at the back of the ear covers so they don't have that white notch uh that that's sort of quite significant um and this is a photograph i got when we went on the family holiday to um to lesbos and i remember at the time photographing them thinking you know they just look like manxies to me um i mean yeah on some of them you can see they've got that darker uh, mark on the underwing but one thing that i did notice when i was looking is you can see they they don't generally do not have that white at the back of the ear coverts um so it just goes straight in the dark neck into the dark ear coverts which is quite a quite an obvious feature when you when you actually look at it so yeah so so we had some uh shear waters they were the cori scopoli's like type the big ones uh off uh, sacolabra so we waited for a time when there didn't seem to be much traffic on the mountain and then bombed up as quick as I could, uh, especially to get past the, the bottleneck spots and uh, just headed back to the hotel, a few windsurfers offshore. So weather was a bit dodgy that day. So <clears throat> next day, uh, there's a few sites just south of um, Alcudia where we were staying. Um, I mean, that, 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 that was a good thing that a lot of the birding sites weren't far away. So, you know, I could just drive off somewhere, you know, half an hour tops um you know at the crack of dawn so have a few hours birding before i go back to the the family while they're and then join them and we'd all go to breakfast together um so uh yeah so yeah that the red spot that's you know not not far from from the hotel probably about 15 minutes drive um this uh diparada son bosque this birding tower over some reservoirs um where the water is very high it's not great for birds but one of the reservoirs, the water dropped quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, I'm not slim enough to sneak through the fence there. If I lost a bit of weight, I might have been able to. Um, and then I would have been able to get better views over, over this sort of wetland area. There's also some adjacent fields where you can get, uh, I think you can get a uh, short to a lot there, but I, I didn't have any joy with those. Um, I didn't have any joy this time, but some bosk is, uh, there's like an area of like rough land next to that reservoir, uh, which is, I think it's the only place on the island where, where bee eaters uh, breed, which I could see from the New York and bird watching uh, Facebook page that there were photographs of them. But unfortunately, I didn't make contact this time. I think when I went in 2006 uh, with Bonnie, we did get good views of them then. Uh, but some of the birds, it was nice. It was a nice, fresh, juvenile Iberian wagtail. Um, so, so that was nice to see at the reservoir. Uh, that's the photograph of the the bird that was at 
uh, Conway, uh, was it last year, I think. Um, so that, that's, uh, they got the white throat and the white supercilium um, and the gray crown. Um, that's that's sort of the main feature. They got very rasping call, um, that's sort of different from the, the, the yellow white tails that we get here in the UK. Other birds that were on the reservoir, blackwing stilts were breeding. Uh, there's some juveniles there. And then, um, so after about 45 minutes birding there, I just headed down, just down the coast a bit to a place called Somme Real. Um, that's like a bit of a farmland area that goes into uh, through a bit of pine woodland. And then there's some like coastal heath uh, birds that we were, that I was getting around there. It was like sort of wild uh, red leg partridge just in front of the walls there. Um, so there's quite a, a meandering selection of paths. Uh, you can get stone curlews there as well, but unfortunately I didn't manage to bump into any. Um, but I mean, that's a great thing with having I mean, sort of Google Maps and Google Earth um, on your phone. And, you know, if you do get lost, uh, as long as you've got a phone reception, you can, you can tell you exactly where where you are. So I, I knew I was working my way to the coast there. Um, I was seeing apparently that you do get turtle doves there, but I, I didn't see any on that trip. But, uh, you know, I've had them recently quite a few times on Anglesey. And this was a bird that I found uh, uh, just down the road by the primary school um, when I went to pick up my son from playing football one evening and um uh the, the funny thing was one one of the mums was showing us this the, the chem ice bay um sort of like uh whatsapp group um the, there's this note went out said uh, rare bird sighting persons are by the school taking photos uh, and they've got binoculars as there's a rare bird above the school uh sightings have been since the weekend the head teacher has cleared this up the old because Obviously, there was, it doesn't look good outside a small primary school when there's loads of people going around with binoculars and cameras, but it was uh, that was my fault because uh, I found the turtle dove that was there. So, um, you know, it's been a few on Anglesey uh, sort of the last few years. Um, but again, sadly, didn't see any uh, when I was in Mallorca there. So the habitat there um, around this coastal area, you've got small uh, low-lying pines and then the coastal heath. Um, it's one of the few spots where you can get Dartford warbler as well as Balearic warbler. Um, I didn't see any uh, when, when I was there. Uh, but again, it reminded me of like the heath at Dunwich uh, down in Suffolk. Um, and there's a, you got a nice view over the sea there um, and some of these sort of viewing platforms. Um, there's, there's also sort of burial chambers uh, there. So um, uh, and just, just sort of seeing where, where they've been buried and um one of, one of the interesting things, so the, this was like Bronze Age, so it was like 2000 to 1600 uh, years BC. And in, in some of the areas that they'd found little bits of slate. So even back then, um, they said that um, uh, they don't get slate on, on the island, but the slate on Menorca. So even back back then, that they, there was evidence that, you know, people were moving between the islands that had gone from Menorca to Mallorca. Um, so yeah, there's some, some of those burial areas that you can actually see. Um, but one of the things that I saw when I was there, um, was the, uh, the local race of woodchat shrike, uh, the baddiest subspecies. Um, if you look at the base of the primaries, it's not got the big white splodge, the big white, uh, mark that the nominate race has that breeds throughout the rest of Europe. And one thing I noticed that the females it was very, very rufous, um, which 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 seemed you know I don't think uh, the ones on the mainland are that rufous, but I didn't know that was actually a feature. Um, but the the lack of a, a, a big white base to the primaries is what distinguishes the Balearic subspecies of woodchat shrike from the nominant race. Um, so these large wasp-like spiders, uh, there's quite a few of those. You had to be careful you didn't walk through those. Quite a quite a, a stunning specimen. Um, that's the lobed argiope. Uh, again, similar to the wasp spider that you might see in southern southern Britain and southeast England. Uh, but one of the things that I saw here that I didn't get anywhere else on this trip was was thecla lark. Um, they, they seem to like it in the edge of the little um, piney areas. Hello. Sorry, made me jump then. Um, yeah, so Thecla Lark uh, look very similar to um, uh, Crested Lark. Uh, the main features, Crested Lark, uh, it's got a long bill uh, with a sort of hooked upper mandible, uh, generally very sandy, quite a plain face and long tail and wings, giving it a longer appearance. Thecla, shorter, stouter bill, a bit more brownish, a bit speckly on the breast with a complex face pattern and short primaries and tail, giving it a compact appearance. But 
one of the good things about Mallorca is you look at the distribution here of crested lark, because I've been to like Spain and Northwest Africa to Morocco, and sometimes you struggle over larks thinking, oh, is that thecla or is it crested? Especially like in, in Morocco, where there's quite a few species of uh, subspecies of, of crested lark. Um, look, luckily, you don't actually get crested lark on uh, on the Balearics. Um, you just get thecla lark, uh, which, as you can see, it's a lot more its range is more confined to sort of Iberia, the Balearics and, and Northwest Africa really, whereas it's it's more extensive on crested lark there. So uh, so that was nice. You know for sure that it's going to be Thecla lark if you're on Mallorca. Um, also at this spot, it was good for getting better, close views of the uh, uh, the Mediterranean subspecies of shag, uh, which got very a longer, thinner bill and the juveniles tend to be quite pale as well. So that was quite nice to see those just offshore. I think that's some kind of species of onion. Um, so yeah, nice little morning walk around the, the coastal heath, uh, uh, seeing Thecla Ark, uh, the burial site, and uh, a few other bits and bobs, um, obviously some feral peafowl, uh, and a couple of serins. Uh, I think that's just small copper butterfly. So the, the family adventure for the day is we went to Ham's uh, Caves, now, these were sort of, again, probably about 45 minutes away uh, from Alcudia, a place called Porto Cristo. Um, quite, quite a nice setting, really. Uh, and it was, you know, they, they were playing classical music uh, in these caves, you know, there was like sort of small underground lake. Uh, but the stalactites uh, were, were fantastic and the and stalagmites as well. Um, so, yeah, it made a nice sort of trip out with the family. Uh, quite spectacular to see, really, um, you know, much bigger than, I mean, there's uh, Dan Rogov in South Wales is pretty cool. But um, I mean, even this place knocked the socks off that. Uh, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Um, there was some pine trees around, so there's a few crossbills flying around as well. And um, yeah, had a spot of lunch after we'd been into the caves. Um, everything was nice and relaxed. We're eating the local food there. Um, even though this does make me laugh here, this uh, frito malo quin, um, typical Mallorcan dish with pork meat, and then it, in brackets it puts liver and lung. Um, um, so yeah, I'm not particularly fond of lung, um, but uh, there we go. I think I went for the one at the top, which didn't have any lung in it. Um, yeah, and then a hornet put cape put an appearance in. So uh, obviously, everyone kind of freaked out a bit because they, they are a little bit sort of uh, scary looking hornets. But thankfully, no one got stung. And then as we went back, um, uh, the, the family hadn't actually been to Albufeira Marsh uh, with 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 me yet because I was usually going at the crack of dawn while I was still in bed. So we did stop off and do a little bit. Um, and that's the entrance to the long walk in. Uh, we did drop off Reese because um, he just wanted to chill by the pool. So we thought, well, well, we'll let him go do that while we had a quick look around the, the wetland reserve. And uh, so Sean um, was at least Sean, Sean was joining in with me, uh, spotting a few birds. So uh, he was getting into the uh, into the, uh, the, the 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 theme of things, uh, watching the uh, that's him seeing his first uh, uh, crested coot there. See, there's Sean and a crested coot below him. Um, yeah, Nia was starting to sort of freak out a little bit because there was quite a lot of mosquitoes around, but there was no dengue fever or malaria there. So, um, but it did get a little bit toxic in the hide when the the sort of deep level reached uh, maximum toxicity. Um, so it was quite difficult watching the birds uh, whilst our eyes were stinging. Um, but the um, yeah, it was nice to see all the sort of uh, black wing stilts and uh, and uh, glossy ibis and things and some of the migratory ducks, uh, migratory gargany would just start to head back. So we had a few of those. Um, and uh, just some of the other bits and bobs, like the rabbits, but much bigger ears than the ones we have here in the UK. Um, so this as well, um, but I didn't realise, I, I think this, I think it's called a blue crab, this. Uh, so I was, I was reading up about it. And um, they, I think they came in from America and they're wreaking havoc in Spanish and Mediterranean waters, just pretty much eating everything as they go. It's like a, a really invasive species. And uh, I think, I think I mean, there's obviously quite a lot of blue in it, but uh, reading up about blue crab and it does seem that that's causing problems in the Mediterranean there. Uh, I think that's grey mullet as well. There's, so there's lots of things around uh, just under the under the bridge there. So um, I think it's just getting a few more um, views of things like that. And kingfisher, uh, that was nice to see. Little tiny, uh, little little bit in there. 
Um, it was only actually when I got home and I was I was looking at the picture a little bit and I realised that top left there was actually a purple heron in the reeds that I didn't actually spot at the time. I only spotted the purple heron when I got home on the phone on the uh, on the laptop. So uh, other things I saw when I was with the rest of the family there, sort of serin, uh, lots of purple swamp hens in front of the hide there. So great opportunity for uh, for getting good photos of the uh, of the swamp hens there. Um, and there's Nia, I think she was getting away from the mosquitoes. She, she ended up legging it um, before she got bitten too much. Um, but on the canal that runs along the uh, the entrance road there, um, the Alduin's girls were coming in uh, to bathe and uh, we got to see a nice fresh juvenile. So that, that was nice to see uh, a lovely fresh juvenile Alduin's girl because that was the only one that we actually saw on the trip there. Yeah, so um, next morning, um, I, uh, where did we visit? I visited, uh, got up before the rest of the family and went to the Bocca Valley. Uh, I had to be careful, almost took off the underside of the car because the uh, car parks were a little bit dodgy around there. Um, some like little fields um, at the entrance to the valley where you can get stone curlew. I heard them calling and I think Scops owls um, are, are there, uh, but I never went there at night. Uh, but it's a nice walk up the valley, so these huge boulders and, you know, quite sort of... Uh, uh, quite typical uh, sort of Balearic habitat there and uh, just wanted to get to the end of the valley. Um, it wasn't quite in sunshine so it was a bit quiet when I was there um, but some of the, you do get Eleonora's falcons at the end. Uh, didn't manage to get any uh, on this time uh, but we did um, I did get some uh, some more Balearic warblers and uh, also got nice nice views, nice fresh juvenile Sardinian warbler and, uh, and a cracking male uh, Sardinian warbler, which was uh, which was nice to see. Um, I remember going up there with Bonnie um, up the Bocca Valley, and and we did have quite a few sail buntings back in two thousand and six. But I didn't I didn't actually bump into any sail buntings on this trip. Um, I don't know, it might just be time of year or something like that. And there was a nice family flock of uh, blue rock thrushes flying around. So on the last full day of the trip, uh, we had. Um, for the afternoon, we went over to Parma, the capital. Um, so it's about an hour from uh, uh, Alcudia and Palenza. Um, you could you could go and watch a football match if you want, because um, uh, you've got Real Mallorca play there. And the, the badge is a little bit similar to Real Madrid. So, uh, you know, if you wanted to wind the kids up, you could tell them you're going to watch Real Madrid and see how long it takes them to uh, twig that it's not actually Madrid, it's Mallorca that you're watching. Um, but this, yeah, it's got, you know, quite a nice, nice city. We went around the cathedral, had a, a little walk around the streets. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very pleasant afternoon. Um, some, uh, some great artwork around the cathedral. Uh, and then we headed off to the, uh, went off to the uh, aquarium uh, for, for an hour or two, just to see what, uh, keep the, keep the kids happy there. Something different to see, sort of Picasso trigger fish. Uh, there's Nemo. And um, and then we we headed back. We kind of came back a funny loop through Manacor. Um, this is the village where the town where Rafael Nadal's from. So we we went to see uh, have a look round round the shop, and he's he's got a, tr a training complex there where he uh, like a tennis school. Uh, was trying to train locals up to uh, uh, reach the standard that that he's reached over the years. So so that that was quite quite nice to see. Um, and then. Uh, sort of headed back to the hotel and we had the only uh, booted eagle of the trip. So that was a nice pale fears booted eagle just went over the car. So I had to screech to a halt and, halt and jump out and got some nice photos as it went by quite close. So uh, the final day, um, just before we left really, I just had one final morning at Albufeira Marsh, uh, just catching up with things like, as I was saying, you know, <laughs> we kept coming across these big flocks of, uh, of marble teal um and then you know other more familiar things cat egrets uh one last visit to the uh, to the main canal where all the uh red knob coots were and uh mustached warbler uh, another nice uh this was an adult uh iberian yellow wagtail that was nice to see and then sort of you know finished off really with some really close views again of, uh, of mustache warbler lovely sort of white super dark crown uh, it was showing really well in front of the hide so that was the best views of, of the trip that i got that was really good and uh, i think the uh the fantail warbler the zitting cysticola was feeling a le bit left out so he joined in as well so so that that was great to see and then uh stone curlew came out and uh and showed really well in front of the hide so uh, so that was that was fantastic 
And um, to finish off with, uh, we had a little bit of a walk with the family before we headed back to the airport and came across a little hoopo, uh, just sat in a tree and uh, Nia and Sean managed to, because they, they love hoopos and they they managed to stalk it and got really close. And uh, and Nia, Nia even managed to find find a feather. And uh, so I st still got that feather there. That's like a nice momentum of, uh, of, of the trip. Uh, uh, the family holiday to uh, to Mallorca, uh, birding Bali Arica. So, thank you very much. Um, I've sort of uh, thank you, Steve, and uh, and thanks for thanks for listening. Oh, it was our pleasure, Steve. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Nigel. I hope you don't mind. We pose a few questions for you. Is that okay. Sure. If anyone's got any, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, you said you mentioned you didn't have any turtle doves. Was that because it wasn't quite the right time? Um, for migration through New York, or have they de have they declined as they have everywhere? So there just aren't many coming through. Do yeah, know? I don't think they're particularly common there anyway. So um, you know, I, I did I didn't see any, and obviously I was I was keeping my eyes open all the time for whatever yeah. we'd see, and I I didn't see any when I was there. Mm. Um, I just saw it just came up on the Facebook page that one had been to the to the feeding area, but I know that was, I think I think they, I mean that was 2019, but they, I think they said that they were still giving shooting permits in Spain right. for turtle doves. So right. I don't know if that's changed since. Um, yeah, well, obviously that's not ideal. Yeah, and are the Eleonoras doing okay on the Foreman tour? Um, well, we we saw. We saw a few, um, yeah. you know. I, I don't know what the what the breeding density is. I know, I know that there's some place. There's like some of the smaller islands off the main island. Uh, there's some islands that you can actually visit, and they they tend to. I think they have big bigger numbers. Um, uh -huh. I do remember when I went with Bonnie. Um, ooh, I think in 2006, I, I did see more uh, around the Cape, but that might have just been. I think we were earlier. Th I, I don't know. We I think we might have been there before they were breeding. So yeah. uh, obviously in August they, they they well they were mating then. So uh, um, I suppose they're good, they're going to be. But saying that, I think they are. I think they are colonial, aren't they? Some some of them yeah. on some of the islands they, they are colonial. Yeah. So right. so they will tolerate you know nearby birds. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what they you know if if they're going up or down. I've not heard anything. Uh, so mm. usually no no news is good news because usually yeah. you hear the bad news, don't you? Yeah. 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 Uh, any any other questions for Steve? Are the black the black vultures, Steve, are they are their numbers uh, fairly consistent these days? Because they were they were really very rare at one point, weren't they? But they've been subject to a lot of conservation effort, I think. I think I had about three, you know, when I was up at the Cuba Reservoir. So they, they were the the only ones that I saw. Um, so you know, I I, I don't know what because I think it's like with Egyptian vultures, isn't it? There's the small numbers there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I did bump into one guy. He, he he was in a hotel just down on the road from where I was, and he, he'd had one Egyptian vulture just drifting along the coast. But generally, the I think they're pretty pretty you know low low density there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, no, I mean it was a great island, you know, great selection of birds to, you know, just enough to keep you going as well as you know doing doing the family stuff as well. Yeah. Perfect. Any questions out there for Steve? There's none in the chat, but Rachel says thoroughly enjoyable, entertaining, and educational talk. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it, it was in, indeed, uh, Steve. I couldn't say it better myself. Um, I have to admit. To, having a certain bias because like you we went on fam fam several family holidays to New York I think it was Dan's first trip abroad uh when I think he was just one or two uh so yeah it brought back a lot of uh, great memories it is a fab island uh especially if, if you have a family there is so much to do and so much to see um and you made that very clear in everything you spoke about and it typically of your talk uh it just combined everything. I mean, I like you. I love my sport. So um, you're the only speaker I know that, that can bring in FA Cup final 1956 and Rafa Nadal, um, as well as all the birds and the wildlife. Well done. It's lovely to hear these tidbits. Uh, it really br helps bring, bring things to life somehow. Um, thanks. thanks, though, as ever, because it's just so informative. Uh, you've got this, this natural uh easygoing style uh where we realize we're learning so much so effortlessly i love the comparisons you made between palette and common swift thank you very much 
and 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 sorting out all those uh, Mediterranean style shearwater is really helpful, and then bring it to bear on things that we that we see here off Anglesey. Um, I'm puzzled by the Thecla lark. Um, I've forgotten that there's only the one on the York. It's strange that there isn't crested lark as well, but maybe there just isn't room room enough for the two of them. I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Um, and yeah, tidbits like that foraging behaviour of moustached uh, uh, warbler acting like a wren. And I don't think you read that in the books, but clearly, you know, if you've seen it and, and it, it's consistent, that's a really good point. So thank you for bringing out all those those things, as well as the, the more obvious stuff, and for just treating us to such a panoply of lovely, gorgeous birds on a on a early spring evening. It was wonderful, and I would like you thoroughly recommend if there's anybody out there who hasn't been to Mallorca, do go. It is just so well worth it, and particularly the northeast part, isn't it? And that's where we stayed too. And you've got everything on your doorstep, haven't you? Um, yeah. both for your interests and for the children's so it is perfect um, and um, one hopes that it will continue to be good for birds certainly the work at Alba Fera, um has been exemplary in terms of encouraging habitat for birds um, and a number of other sites in the south as well I think so I hope that continues and it will be encouraged by uh, more and more bird watchers and other wildlife enthusiasts going and showing their appreciation of it and in many ways, um, it, it does illustrate a point made by a lot of uh, speakers over this year and years before, is that it is important, I think, for, for there to still be, despite COVID and all the concerns about overseas travel, opportunities for people to go and enjoy them for themselves, but also make people in those countries aware that we really appreciate their wildlife and the conservation efforts that are being made uh, and until you've been there, done that, seen it, you can't quite feel that passion and have that interest, which we do so desperately need to continue with. So that always comes out in your talk, Steve. Thanks very much indeed. And your memory is phenomenal. Uh, I would in no way be able to remember all the sights, sounds and places and birds and other wildlife that you mentioned so easily and without reference to notes. Well done. Don't know how you do it. It's been a great program. Uh, I know you've, you've had a helping hand in it with uh, uh, helping Kathy. We look forward to another of your uh, in, intimate and uh, uh, very distinctive programs uh, coming up this year. Thanks for taking on that role again. So much appreciate it. And thanks for tonight. Great way as ever to end a super program. Yeah, all the best. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Okay. We look forward Thank to you. seeing you again.